The speaker. Member for Port of Spain North, St. Anne's West. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, just before the break, I was speaking to the civic-minded citizens of Trinidad and Tobago and putting the crime debate motion into context and just notifying them as to what transpired and what we came in and met as a government just before I launch to then tell the people of Trinidad and Tobago what it is that we have done as a government. And Madam Speaker, one of my colleagues told me during the break that I should take the time to explain to the population about the facial recognition system that had existed. The facial recognition system. And as I say again, and I stand, as I stood here and I looked at the faces, and no pun intended, of my colleagues on the other side, and I worked through those who would have been in that former cabinet, I could see the genuine look of shock and the genuine look on quite a few faces, my friend from Tabaki, Chigonas East, amongst others, hearing these stories. And Madam Speaker, every single fact that I have just stated is 100% accurate. And I stand here without fear of contradiction. So what I was saying, Madam Speaker, is that certain ports of entry into Trinidad and Tobago, prior to May 2010, as part of the security apparatus of protecting the borders and shores of Trinidad and Tobago, there was facial recognition software. And what that means is, as people are coming through, various cameras will pick up the faces of people coming through, feed into a database, and then known criminals or persons who are suspects or wanted persons, it would pop up. So you have a crowd of 20, 30 coming through an entry point, and if their faces are picked up on this recognition system, a warning would come up to the law enforcement authorities, Madam Speaker, telling them there is criminal X or criminal Y. Madam Speaker, that was dismantled. So prior to 2015, during the period 2010 to 2015, the facial recognition software was dismantled by the authority, not the law enforcement authorities, on the instruction, instructions of some of those who sat on the opposite side. Mm. So if you have such porous borders and you have all of these internal attacks and destruction of the technology that is designed and designated to protect Trinidad and Tobago, what do you expect to happen? So a PNM administration coming in, and this is not an excuse, Madam Speaker. Citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, this is not an excuse. This is the reality of what we faced. So at the National Security Council level, chaired by the Prime Minister, we began to move immediately and one of the first things we did is authorize the repair of the various systems, authorize the upgrading of the various systems to provide not only the intel intelligence services, but other law enforcement bodies with the capability of fighting crime. So to sit here and listen to the Honorable Member for Separia criticize this government, Madam Speaker, if before the break, at certain times, my tone became a little angered and strained, that was genuine, because as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, and now someone who has been given the responsibility and has the knowledge of what it is we're faced with, it pains me. Because like everyone else in this house, I have family. And every time any citizen of Trinidad and Tobago 
is affected by crime, as we've seen over the last couple of days, it does genuinely pain me as a representative for Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, but more importantly, as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. Because, Madam Speaker, any patriotic citizen of Trinidad and Tobago would want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And just before I move on, let me close the point of legislation. Madam Speaker, when the PNM government was in power during 2002 to 2007, there were certain bills that were brought to Parliament to support the law enforcement agencies in their fight against crime. And I repeat, and let the citizens understand this, it is not that the government is passing the responsibility onto the law enforcement agencies. That is their statutory responsibility. I have no power of search and arrest. I have a common law power as a citizen if I believe a crime is about to be committed. But I am not a police officer. I don't have the power and ability to go and investigate crime and prosecute crime. So why is it that those on the other side are criticizing us when we say it is the police service that must do that? That is what the laws of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago say, Madam Speaker. So in 2002 to 2007, the kidnapping bill that was brought by a PNM government in 2003, it was not supported by a UNC government. The Mutual Assistance in Criminal Matters, a bill that allows persons to pursue criminality and try and bring it to its heels. Again, in 2004, PNM government brought that to the parliament. The opposition did not support the bill. That is those on the other side. The Administration of Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill 2004. The Criminal Procedure Amendment Bill 2004. The Indictable Offenses Preliminary Inquiries Amendment Bill. During our tenures, this new government and administration, again, we're tackling preliminary inquiries. But in 2005, when a PNM government tried to fix, tried to assist the criminal justice system and make it more efficient, unfortunately, those on the other side didn't support. And it is these types of measures that affect the lives of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. In fact, I remember us being here in the first few months of forming this new government and trying to continue legislation that they brought, the, the bail bill yeah. and the anti-gang legislation we that we supported when we were in opposition. They put a sunset clause. It expired under us as a government. We told them, support it with us. I came here and stood here, Madam Speaker, and read a sworn affidavit from the Commissioner of Police where he made the case for the continuation of the anti-gang legislation and the bail amendment bill to allow the law enforcement agencies to fight crime. And I pleaded with those on the other side, the 41 of us here in the House, support legislation that a UNC government brought. In North St. Anne's West, your original speaking time is now expired. You're entitled to 15 more minutes if you intend to avail yourself of it. Thank you, you very much. Proceed. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So again, you're asking what we did as a government. We came to the House, as is our duty and our responsibility, and we asked for the support of the opposition in continuing legislation that they brought to the House when they were in government and that we supported in opposition. We said, let it continue. And let me remind the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, that legislation would have allowed the law enforcement agencies, when they find people with illegal firearms, to detain them and they're not entitled to bail for an extended period of time to allow the law enforcement agencies to put their case together and to follow more leads. It is legislation that made sense. The commissioner of police, not, none other than the person who is charged with the responsibility of leading the police service. I read from his affidavit, this is making a positive effect. This is making a positive effect on the fight against crime. Look. Please continue, Member. Thank you very much. Answer. And again, I will tell the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago that Kearney Central is trying to interrupt 
on a point of order saying that I'm reconsidering legislation. I'm not. I'm dealing with the motion that you are bringing trying to mislead the public and trying to put the blame of crime on this government. I have spent the majority of my debate pointing out to the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago what it is that a former administration did that put us in this place. Allow me now, Madam Speaker, to refer to two, two reports that were laid in the Parliament, the Interception of Communications Act, and I'll go through it briefly because I want to speak about what we have done as a government. When we studied this, under the, the former administration from 2010 to 2015, they did not lay in Parliament reports that are statutory reports that must be laid about the interception of communication. So they sit here and they talk about spying. And I'm not going to get into the Rashmi Ramnarayan saga. They talk about spying. And part of the legislation, the Protection of the Interception of Communications Act, is that every year, those who have the authority and the power to intercept communications must lay in the, house of, the Houses of Parliament a report saying how many people were intercepted, how many warrants were sought, what happened with it, etc. Without getting to specifics of who it was. That was not done under the tenure of 2010 to 2015 by a UNC People's Partnership government. What happens when we come into government? Is Devon Maraj not so? A former member of the cabinet brings legislation against the people of Trinidad and Tobago saying that, that those, those reports weren't laid. They weren't laid by his administration. Again, he comes to tax the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago. But I'm happy to say that what the judge told him, what, what the judge told him, Madam Speaker, is, but hold on. You were part of the administration that was in charge and should have produced those reports and didn't. I'm not granting you the order. and gave the government the opportunity. And the Honorable Minister of National Security went and he worked with those who are in charge of getting a report done and got it done. And you know what's interesting? Let me tell the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago what happened in 2013 to 2014. Because that act provides for police to go to the courts to get an evidential warrant to intercept communication. And they have to prove to the court why it is they want to do that. And it's the police who should do that. This was the most, one of the most disturbing things that have come to us as a cabinet in the last 20 months. Correct. Madam Speaker, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, and all civic-minded citizens, in the year 2013, only nine warrants were sought by the Commissioner of Police. No warrants were sought by the body charged with the responsibility and who have, who have the possession and the control of the equipment, the Strategic Services Agency. Remember the name I called a short while ago, who was heading this and what happened after. When you look, number of warrants applied for to intercept communications by the SSA under their period for 2013, none. Number of warrants granted, none. Number of warrants applied for and granted, none. Average period for warrants, none. Number of warrants refused by court, none. So under them for a whole year, they didn't apply for a single warrant. But you know what's interesting? Let me tell the people of Trinidad and Tobago, they want to talk about talk on phone and who's spying on who. In that year, not a single application was made to court for a warrant. But they listened to 283,418 conversations. Wow. 283,418 conversations. Not a single one for evidential purposes. Is that why they didn't want to put this in there at the time when they were in government? We will not be so responsible. We have been in government, so irresponsible. We have been in government from September 2015, and the first year we had to lay the report in parliament, it was done by the Minister of National Security. We are open and a transparent government. And what have we done? Let me get very briefly, Madam Speaker, to what it is as a government we've done. As I said, we are not the ones who go out there to fight crime. Our duty is to assist with policy. Our duty is to ensure that proper resources are had for the law enforcement agencies. One of the first things we met, and my honorable colleague, the member for Point Fourteen, can attest to this. When we came into office, 
immediately our foreign partners came running to us our foreign allies and when I say our Trinidad and Tobago came running to us I won't call the names of the first world countries and they said listen are you all prepared to re-establish relationships I said ah, what they said for the last five years it's been a one-way street I personally have had to go along with Minister Dillon, the Prime Minister, the Attorney General, and lead the charge for Trinidad and Tobago in rebuilding our relationships with some of the most sophisticated law enforcement countries in the world. They said no information was flowing, it was a block. We were at risk, and again, I say this for the people of Trinidad and Tobago, we, Trinidad and Tobago, were at risk and we were threatened by the United Kingdom between 2010 and 2015 that we will have to become, it would be necessary for us to travel to the UK, we would have to have visas. You know why? Because they wanted to dismantle the services that were working with the British to fight crime and stop drug running in the Caribbean. Immediately we moved and what did we do? Rebuilt the relationship and we bolstered it. The same thing with some of our other partners. So don't stand here and bring these types of motions and try to fear monger in Trinidad and Tobago and get our population worked up about crime. We are all concerned about crime. I, I hope there's not a single member amongst the 41 of us who is not prepared to do what they can to fight crime as, as we can here, which is passing legislation. The Attorney General for the past few months has been leading the charge and they've been mocking it. Oh, you come with a sweeter legislation. You're crime fighting. You're improving the, the, the criminal. Up to this week, we were in here. Today's Friday. We were in here on Wednesday with one of the pieces of legislation. And they were mocking it. Saying, oh, how are you going to improve the criminal justice system? We will do what we can, Trinidad and Tobago. And I stand here as part of this government, a proud part of the government. And I give the assurance of Trinidad and Tobago and every civic-minded citizen of Trinidad and Tobago that when we come to this house, we will bring legislation we think is going to help Trinidad and Tobago. A lot of that legislation so far has been to the fight against crime. Plea bargaining. Plea bargaining is an important tool in the fight against crime. And yes, it is a sweet. You join that with an election of a judge, by, uh, uh, election of a trial by a judge only and these other pieces those are what the government has been doing from a legislative point of view. We have rebuilt, thankfully, we have now rebuilt the relationship with international agencies by, of our foreign so sovereign countries in assisting. How do you fight ISIS? How do you fight international criminals and terrorists? You have to share information. We have gone out there and personally rebuilt those relationships and the information is now flowing both ways once again. And as I touch on that, Madam Speaker, allow me. Life sport. Life sport. It is a fact that life sport bred criminality in this country. Deliberately. Life sport bred criminality in this country. Carapo and other gangs were born out of life sport. $400 million worth right so we have come in and we are fighting the crime as we can as a government part of that there's a responsibility on each and every one of us colleagues when we come with legislation don't oppose the legislation for opposition's sake don't be destructive i've heard it said time and time again but by by members of the opposition and not necessarily my colleagues here now that our opposition's duty is to oppose the government yes but not to oppose Trinidad and Tobago. So ultimately do what is right for Trinidad and Tobago. Put aside the destructiveness. Let us work together. Let us find a way to bring the legislation to this house. That's all we can do in this house. What else we've done as a government? We've rebuilt the relationships with our international partners. We are providing as much resources as we possibly can. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force, and the SSA. They try to bastardize the SSA in here. The SSA is a body born out of legislation. And I think this legislation passed under you all in 1995. You all created SSA. Do not destroy what is good and what can help in the fight against crime, colleagues. 
I am pleading with you. I am pleading with you on behalf of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Put it aside. Let us do what is right. We've done a whole host of legislation. The Attorney General wanted me to talk about what he's doing in the prisons. I'm not going to have sufficient time. But there are committees working. We're also working with the Canadian prison system. We have people from the prison service and the Attorney General's office right now in Canada looking at how it can be bettered. We're looking at improving the prisons physically, but also other things. We're trying to get the video conferencing facility going. These are the things your government is doing for you. We're giving them better equipment. We're looking at the radar system. We're always looking at ways to improve. But the truth is, colleagues, Madam Speaker, citizens of Trinidad, we are in very difficult financial times. But we will do all that we can to assist in the fight against crime. Yesterday when the kidnapping took place, the amount of us at the cabinet level that were seeing how we could help, what we could do, it affects all of us. As the member for Shagwanas East spoke about at the beginning of his contribution, the heinous crime committed on that 13-year-old boy. I went home that night and looked at my son sleeping. And the sense of despair I felt, Madam Speaker, these are citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. And I keep saying in this house, Madam Speaker, and I'll say it again, for me, and I'm certain for my colleagues on this side, we do believe and we do live by part of our national anthem that says, Every creed and race find an equal place. And I know my colleagues on the other side would subscribe to that as well. So let us stop the politicization. That politics, I agree. I'm, I'm new to this. I'm learning. There will be politicization of issues. But ultimately, when legislation comes to this house, and that is what this house is about, that can improve the lives of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, make it safer, etc., do not oppose, do not be destructive just for opposition's sake. If you come with good amendments and suggestions, we will listen to it. Madam Speaker, as I said, and I'd like to close by saying, we have walked that talk as a PNM. When we were in opposition, we supported during 2010 to 2015, 92% of the legislation brought to Parliament. And that is what a responsible opposition does for the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. So, Madam Speaker, with those words, I thank you very much for the opportunity to contribute. And hopefully, going forward, henceforth, we in this house, the 41 of us, will put aside the pettiness and we will do what is right for Trinidad and Tobago. Member for Tabaki. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, sometimes the member for Paul Spain, North St. Anne's West, believes that the more dramatic he is in his presentation, the more the country will believe what he has to say. Especially when you try to peddle information that does not have all the truth attached to it. And some of the things that he, he has referred to in his presentation, I will have to reply to in order to set the record straight. But before I do that, Madam Speaker, I think it's incumbent upon me also to express the horror that is taking place at our very doorsteps in Trinidad and Tobago, but particularly in Trinidad, and not, not to leave out Tobago. Tobago, which has not had murders, have had five murders, I believe, for this year already, which is in itself, you know, horrific. And that has its own economic cost in terms of loss in tourism revenue um, in Tobago. But Madam Speaker, while we shudder and while we tremble at the horror of the murder of this 13-year-old boy and the very brutal manner in which it, it was done, Madam Speaker, I, as I drove into Port Spain this morning, drove around Chaguanas, I went down to Faisabad and coming up back, I just looked at people going about their business as usual. And I asked myself, is it that as a country, we have now become numb to the horrific murders and the crime situation around us? Is it that we tend to have such a very short memory now about the last murder, <coughs> no matter how heinous that last murder is? Madam Speaker, if I had my way and if I were the leader of this country, I would call on this country this Sunday coming, not to do anything else, but in every village, 
in every town, in every home, in every temple, in every church, in every institution, call upon every NGO and CBO and every uh, citizen of this country to lift your voice somehow and to make a statement somehow that you do not like what is happening in Trinidad and Tobago and there must be an intervention that is for the sake of the future of the country and the protection of citizens. Something has to be done and we cannot continue to do so. And this brings me directly to my good friend, the member for Port Spain, North St. Anne's West, and the members of the government who believe that 21 months of blaming the former administration and 21 months of harping on what they did pre-2010 pre is going to solve the problems of today and the problems of tomorrow. Madam Speaker, the country is fed up of listening to they who say they are in charge, continuing to blame the past administration. The past administration has paid the penalty by losing the last elections and we accepted that. If the country told us so, we accepted that. But they came on the very first minute of this parliament when they spoke. The Minister of Tourism, followed by the, mini the, the Minister of Planning, saying we are in charge and you have to deal with that. Well, we are saying you are in charge now. And the country is saying you are not dealing with the crime situation in the country. And nothing, you cannot escape the responsibility that is upon you to act as any responsible government will act, vested as you are with the authority and the power to act on behalf of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. And you are failing miserably in that responsibility, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Honourable Member for Paul Spain, North St. Anne's West, like so many of his, his colleagues, continue to talk about the OPVs and the fact that the OPVs were cancelled and what have you. I've heard this story over and over and over. And it's part of a narrative that they have been developing since 2009, prior to the 2010 elections, a narrative that they have been developing, which they hope to sustain uh, about about the inefficiency of this government and so on. But I'll show you that we were not that inefficient as they say, but we were very efficient in terms of our management. Because we have not spoken as much as we should speak of what we also inherited when we came into the, into the government, the state of the economy that we were able to turn around. And with it, not only increased the potential for people to get jobs and got jobs, but also brought down the crime rate, serious crimes, in a very substantial way. Madam Speaker, let's get to the truth about the OPVs. The OPVs were defective. Let us face the truth. They were defective. Yes. And a major cost in that defect was a highly sophisticated weapon system that was not working. And yet the OPV fanatics seem upset that taxpayers were not burdened with purchasing a lemon. We were going to purchase a lemon. Madam Speaker, would anyone purchase a new vehicle if the air condition or engine is defective? No, you would not. The matter went to court. The matter went to court. If we were not sure that they were not lemons, why would we go to arbitration? Why would we go to court? We went to court. We went to court. And in the arbitration, it was directed that all the initial payments be returned to the country of Trinidad and Tobago. And the court would not have done this if the items were, were not defective and if the supplier failed to deliver as required. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, it was defective. And what happened is that what was cost in this country, some $2.4 billion, we got back $1.4 billion Whoa. in the arbitration. Madam Speaker, we saved the country $1.2 billion and we have turned around and bought Coast Guard vessels, Damien vessels, patrol vessels, utility vessels, and these vessels are now patrolling. They are patrolling. And the Honorable Minister of National Security came to this very parliament and, and on several occasions praised the yes. Damien vessels. What hypocrisy it is to come and say one thing and then you have your other colleagues preaching another thing, uh, Mr. Minister of National Security. Madam, Madam Speaker, whether you paid for them or not, the fact is, you paid with the $1.4 billion that we also got back Correct. from a bad deal from BAE. So let us put the records straight and stop this nonsense about saying that we, we cancelled the OPVs. We are not going as a country to buy lemons. We are not going to do it. You come and the second point my good friend from Portsmouth, North St. Anne's West, made has to do 
with the with the um, helicopters, with the helicopters. Those helicopters were bought prior to 2010. And the helicopters, the Augusta Choppers for the Air Guard, they cost $2.2 billion. I want them to deny whether, in fact, the market price was $80 million each for those helicopters. But the contract was padded. The contract was rigged in maintenance and training that amounted to hundreds of billions of dollars. They got locked in. They got locked in into those contracts. Member? And I, I'm sure he's heard you. It's his discretion. Please continue, Member for that. They locked into those contracts with maintenance and training uh, contracts that amount to mil hundreds of millions of dollars and they could not uh, get out of the contracts because they were locked into it. We inherited that madness. That is the part of the madness we inherited. And now we are hearing them complaining about what was done by, the, by us in two, prior to post-2010. We tried to correct these situations. So to say now that they are, they are shutting down the helicopters because it's costing $200 million a year to maintain, they must go back and say what kind of contract they negotiated and why, why it is that what was supposed to cost $80 million each amounted to $2.2 billion. They must, they must go back and say that. Madam, Madam Speaker, what is regrettable is what we are all hearing, is that if you go down to the, to the, the islands and you'll see most of the 12... Coast Guard vessels now, more at Stobles Bay. Why? The government refusing what? Manpower strength for the Coast Guard? Why are you not doing more recruitment for the Coast Guard so that those vessels could be doing what, 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 what they're supposed, supposed to be doing, Madam Speaker? Madam Speaker, let them also deny the fact that had they bought those OPV vessels, two of them would have been parked up because they did not have the manpower to run those vessels and they would have been parked up because they didn't do enough uh, manpower planning in order to ensure that those boats would be properly um, fitted with the human resources that they needed, needed to have. So those are two points. Then, Madam Speaker, the matter of sort, the agency that my friend um, sp spoke about. Madam Speaker, what is the truth? The fake news is that we, have, we, we, we shut down sort. And, uh, what, is the, what is the true news? The true news, crime under sort. During the period of sort, crime was the highest ever in the country. Serious. It was the highest ever in the country, Madam Serious. Speaker. Homicides reaching 540 per annum in 2008, when sort was supposed to be at its finest in 2008. Kidnapping then was totally out of control and was the highest ever. 155. 22,000 serious crimes, highest ever under sort. When sort was closed down, serious crime came down to about 11,000, 11,000. Are they saying that the statistics provided by the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, which showed that serious crimes were reduced from between 25 to 83%, that the police are lying about the crime statistics? Are you saying that you have no confidence in the police statistics? That's a terrible, terrible thing to say about the police, you know. When in fact the, the acting commissioner of police has been repeated and repeating how much the serious crimes have come down um, under the period 2010 to 2015. And even recently, in 2016, he indicated that it had come down further. So it, 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 is, it, is not, it is very untrue to, to some of the things you, you are saying, very misleading, if you, if you, you may, may have me say, some of the things you are saying, when in fact the statistics and the evidence bears out something very differently. So some things we were doing were bringing results to the country, and you cannot deny, deny that at all. Madam Speaker, then the Honourable Member spoke about gangs, and that life sport was the cause of, of the explosion in gangs in Karapu and what have you. There was a very good person, a human being, in the person of Mr. Martin Joseph. Mr. Martin Joseph, I'd hired him to teach with me at Roy Tech when, when, I, when I was there at Roy Tech as the academic advisor. Very good person. 
Mr. Martin Joseph was the one who reported to this country on several occasions how many gangs existed while he was in fact the Minister of National Security. And where these gangs were located and what have you. Gangs did not begin nor grow under the administration of the People's Partnership. The gang culture and the growth of gangs took place while the PNM was in its heyday in the country. What is important is not to blame where, what period of time the gangs grew or didn't grow. The, what is to be dealt with is what are we doing as a country and as a government to dismantle the gangs in the country. That is what is important. Correct. What, what are we doing to deal with the situation? The country is fed up of hearing the cross talk. The country wants to know what you are doing. And Madam Speaker, that's what I came to address here this evening in us. Some of the more fundamental causes of crime in the country. Madam Speaker, you know, I, I came to this parliament and I had one intention, if in five years I would have achieved it, which was to deal with that matter of ADD and ADHD. That was a very serious matter for me. Because I have seen what has happened to children who have ADHD, in particular in schools, and how they are shunted, and how they are left aside, and they fall through the cracks. And, and children like that have an ability to, to, to gravitate to people who show them some kind of love, but sometimes those are the wrong people, and then they end up in the wrong hands. Madam Speaker, I want to say today I'm disappointed. Disappointed when I hear the responses of the Honorable Minister of Education, and ask the questions over and over, what has been done? to train teachers in the schools about ADHD and how to deal with it. And Madam Speaker, I say without fear of contradiction and without apology that the Minister has not convinced me. And I went back after his last answer in Parliament and I went back to certain schools and asked, have you been trained specifically in dealing with ADHD children? Madam Speaker, nothing like that has taken place, I tell you, in the country schools. It has not taken place, Madam Speaker, and today 8% of the children in this school continue to suffer. Those are the statistics I research. 8% of the children, which is interesting, is very much like the global figure with this ADHD. And that is part of your problem also. You have to deal with, with, with the crime situation from the kids coming right up, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, so I want to say to my worthy friend from Paul Spain, North St. Anne's West, it's not about the past. It's not about your laurels of the past. Those are gone. Yesterday has gone. The present is, is the reality that we are dealing with. Because you don't deal with the re reality of the present, you would not have a future. And, not, and people would not have a future in this country. So what are you doing as a government in order to, to deal with the crime? We are going to do what we have to do on the side of the opposition. The opposition's role is to constantly keep you on your feet and keep your mind focused on the fact that you are doing nothing and therefore you must step out of those dark alleys and, and begin to do something. And no amount of blaming, no amount of castigating, no amount of shouting us down. We, we, we will change us from our goal of reminding you that you have a responsibility to the citizens of this country to provide safety and security um, of, of, of the person. Madam Speaker, you know this country is so tense, so tense, Madam Speaker, that a couple of um, hours ago on the Trinidad Express newspaper, the Trinidad Express is reporting about explosions taking place, um, so, took place somewhere in the east and scaring people in, in several communities. And they're wondering whether it's an exercise being done by the army. Now, the army generally will announce whether it has um, exercises like this. But if the place is shaken up from Aruka to Sani Grandi, and people are worried about it, it is strange that no announcement has been made thus far by the Public Affairs Unit of the Defense Force as to what these explosions were. If it is National Quarries is dynamiting something, let us know that National Quarries is dynamiting something. But not, never in the past um, have they ever... Um, uh, has the country ever come up to, to do this? People reported the sound in Ruka, Picton Road, Valencia, Guayco, Vega, de Oropu, Sani Grande, Arima, Kumoto, Sani, Chiquito, Tanaputan, and Coal Mine. That is a vast area where you are hearing along the East West Corridor earth shaking explosions at around 11 a.m. today. And this is by Sandhya Santun, multimedia desk of the South Bureau of the Trinidad Express. What is happening? What is happening? And people are tense about these things. Because you, you, if people want to know what is happening in their country. But, you know, for the Express to be reporting it, a very credible newspaper, 
it shows you how tense the country is. The people are, are just not settled. Jittery. They are jittery. They are jittery. Madam Speaker, so it is very important for me to point out so, uh, these matters with respect to what my friend on the other side um, has, been, has been saying. Madam Speaker, over the last few days, a couple of statements from senior members of the government have left me um, wondering as to whether really the government has a, the government has a ba the government members have abandoned their responsibility for the state of crime in our country, and I refer to statements being made, for example, by the honourable minister uh, for ag of agriculture in the country, the honourable minister of agriculture, who expressed his um, dissatisfaction with the, with the state of the police service and the way the police um, are operating. And then you, the, the Honourable Prime Minister himself didn't mince his words in terms of um, his criticism of, of the police. And I think it's important that we note this because when, when the senior members of government begin to express their dissatisfaction with the police or their lack of confidence in the police when they are in charge through the Minister of National Security and the National Security Council for the defense forces and the police in the country then what is left for the citizen? Government Minister Karen Rambarat um, in an Anna Ramdas Express article said I am on record Madam President that I am not a fan of the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service Every time I pass police officers in the police canteen, well, it looks like he limes in the police canteen. <laughs> Every time I pass by the barracks and I see the police vehicles parked up there, used, unused, savage, destroyed, whatever, I know that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service forms part of the critical failing of the criminal justice system. Wow. Madam Sika, that is a, a, a real a, 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 a indictment upon, upon the police service. A real, real indictment by a senior minister of government. And, 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 and what it shows is that when, when you are not expressing, expressing confidence in an important institution like the police service, you are, you are either, you are at the same time probably demotivating and demoralizing them further. But what is, what is even more important to me is that you are, are you admitting or are you suggesting that the police service is a failed institution. Because you see, I have a theory that there are so many failed institutions in the country and that is why this country is in the state that it is. The health service is a failed institution. You can't get drugs in the health service. I have a situation now on my desk where for a year a man can't get a barium, um, uh, whatever it is, in San Fernando General Hospital. Right? Right? You look at the judiciary. One might say it's a failed institution. There are so many failing, fail or failing institutions in the country. And is it now that the, the government themselves, they're chastising the, the, the police service and saying this about, about the police service? This is, this is frightening. And uh, you know, it's not just, it's not just um, the, 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 minister, the Minister of Agriculture, the Prime Minister himself, you know, expressed, um, he says, uh, he expressed his own concern. So, sorry, sorry. But I remind you all with respect to the standing orders concerning electronic devices. During the sitting today, this must have been about the fifth time a device has gone up. Please turn off your devices. Thank you, Madam President. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Honorable Prime Minister, he said crime wars troubling him. He says the government is trying to build the capacity of the defense mechanisms of the police, the Coast Guard, the Defense Force, so they could appropriately respond to those persons who have chosen crime as a way of life and to protect those who might become victims of crime. But Madam Speaker, then he goes on to say that it is the police themselves who have the responsibility to fight the crime and to deal with the crime. Um, the member for Paul Spain not put it another way. He said he doesn't lock up people. He doesn't have that authority and so on. Madam Speaker, that brings me
to our important world because he is re reiterating something said by his prime minister on April 12, 2017, where crime fighting is police work, not government work. Crime fighting is police work, no government. I take issue with that. Everything in this country is government work. Okay. It's government work. If there are no drugs in the hospitals, it is the minister's responsibility to make sure that he gets up on his permanent secretary and others to make sure there are drugs there, Mr. Minister. Don't pass the ultimately. If the judiciary cannot find the resources, it's the attorney general who must move in order to do that expeditiously, expeditiously to ensure that that happens. Ministers cannot escape their responsibilities. They cannot do that. And Madam Speaker, that's bring, that brings me to the point. Madam Speaker, as a manager, as a leader, as a minister, as a prime minister, as a cabinet, you cannot delegate responsibility. There's a difference between responsibility and authority. You can delegate authority and hold people responsible for their agreed performance goals. But when there are no performance goals at all, what are you going to... Um, Hold people responsible for. Who has given the commissioner, acting commissioner of police, performance goals to, to reach? Who has done that? The police service commission? Have we ever heard in this country what are the performance goals of the police service? By how much they are going to reduce crime over the next year? You know, everything in this country is after the fact, you know. Measurable. After the fact, this is why I say we are a great nation of analysts and talkers, but are we a nation of doers? <coughs> Do we? There's, that's right, there's no measurement. Therefore, how can you achieve anything if there is no measurement in the country? You, you see, you can delegate authority, but you cannot delegate responsibility. I want to make that point. The Prime Minister in his statement seemed to think that he has delegated responsibility. And so, you know, I, 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 I must admit that I've reached a point when I look at the Prime Minister and I look at how the Prime Minister is running the affairs of this country and by what he says, that he is happy he, is, he achieved the goal of Prime Minister, but he's very disinterested in the role of Prime Minister. Very disinterested. <coughs> Madam Speaker, you are responsible for the performance of the people to whom you have delegated authority. Correct. And therefore, we have to ask the question whether effective delegation is taking place in this country in terms of the police service. Yes, you must provide people with the authority to do the job. That authority would be in terms of the legislation and the powers and so on. And we are willing to support the good legislation that will help the police to do their job. You say you have a suite of legislation, bring it. We are debating it. We are making changes to it. We are supporting it. Secondly, you have to provide, when you delegate authority, you have to provide people with the resources, the human resources, the material resources, the physical resources, and the financial resources. If you want the police to solve crime, you do not do that simply by increasing the number of crime, crime investigators, say 60, you know. You have to say, what support do they need to really crack the crime? What tools they need? And the tools are not just skills and knowledge. There are other resources that they need. You see, Madam Speaker, this is it, you know. Today when this debate started and the member for Laventil was best for speaking, Madam Speaker, you know, they were he was making a virtual joke of this whole thing about crime in the country, a very serious man. I sat here, I sat here in disgust, I'll be honest with you, because I said a serious thing like the loss of a life of a child, and we are talking about it here, and a joke is being made um, of, of this all. You do not joke with citizens' lives in this country. You don't do that. You don't joke with citizens' lives. Madam Speaker, the third point is, you have to give people the required training a lot of people are being trained in the police service, in criminology, in, in what have you and so on. But are they being trained in what it takes to solve crime and prevent crime? Madam Speaker, in this regard, let me mention the manpower audit that is taking place in the country. You have Professor Ramesh Devsaran being appointed with others to undertake a manpower audit. And the first thing Professor Devsaran 
seems to be doing with his team is going around the country to meet people. Well, they came to Paul of Spain or somewhere and one person attended. They came to Chaguanas, I went. Because I have an interest in what is going on in my town in Chaguanas. And I've said to the member for point 14 several times. And I've put in his hand several times and nothing has been done about it. About the chaos that is taking place on the streets of Chaguanas. And the number of times I've said publicly in this parliament that I've spoken to Superintendent McIntyre but nothing has been done. And Mr. Minister, I'm disappointed that even I haven't spoken to you. Even haven't texted the commissioner of police who promised to intervene. Nothing has been done to alleviate the situation there. In Chaguanas. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, so we talk about the manpower audit. Madam Speaker, 20 people maximum attending Chaguanas. Why are people not attending those meetings? Because people are fed up. They know nothing is going to happen. They see all this as another public relation ruse to take people's minds away from the incompetence of the government in dealing with the fundamental issue of crime. And I said that to Professor Deusran. I said, Professor Deusran, you're a man of international reputation. You are, you are sought after to give lectures all over the world. But how much of what you have in fact recommended to government after government has been implemented in your own country? And I told him and I warned him, I said, don't be part of being used in another public relations exercise on behalf of a failing government. Madam Speaker, that's a very simple matter at Manpower Audit. First thing you have to do, identify what are the critical issues that face the police service. And especially in the areas that will impact upon crime and solving crime. And then go back to your resource, human resource base and say, do I have these resources and competencies in the people? If I don't, how do I close that gap, for, gap quickly? The, 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 the problems are known. You don't, don't have to go through another exercise to go back and ask people about the problems again. Go there and look at your human resources. I was shocked. Shocked, Madam Speaker, in that, in that interaction I had with DCP um, Harold Phillip. That he said, this is on record, he said that only 1,000 policemen might really be truly on a shift in this country. 1,000 policemen? That cannot in fact protect the people of this country. That was said by him. Yes, it was said by him. 1,000. Madam Speaker, you, so that you, you, you have to do all of these things when you delegate. So that people can carry out their functions. So you are saying that the, the police service is in, inadequate in combating crime. But you must answer the questions and the reasons as to why, therefore, are they inadequate. Are they inadequate? I would ask a question. The original 30 minutes are now spent. You're entitled to 15 more minutes of extended time, but of course you know the rule as, as of six sure, months. You may proceed. Sure, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, there are many sources of inadequacy. At one point in time, they, they used to say it's vehicles, but we have bought over 600 vehicles when we were in office for the police service. Right? They said the equipment. I remember we bought um, new firepower guns and so on for, for them. Is it the fear of the criminal elements? Is it attitude, remuneration? We tackle remuneration, as you know. Is it hygiene factors? We built nine police stations, new police stations, and repaired quite a number of others. Is it, is it the level of motivation or the sense of belongingness that they feel to their job? It might be that. But the, re but, but the end result is it seems that a level of frustration in the police service that is very high under this government. And one has to ask, why is that level of frustration? And when people are frustrated in any kind of situation, they do two things. It's either they fight or there's flight. Fight or flight. Flight means that they are in the job, but they are not on the job. And fight means that they are going to get into some kind of combat with you. And again, it affects the productivity. So what is important, what is important in all that I've said so far is the common thread is that leadership that develops strategy on the one hand and management of people, systems and processes on the other hand is desperately missing under this government. Desperately missing. And that has to come from the top. 
That has to come from the National Security Council, the Minister of National Security. I mean, it said that that is something you have to look at. So it comes to squarely to the back you're saying is the performance of the police commissioner. Well, you cannot say to me, and no one can say to me in this country, that the absence of a police commissioner is in fact the problem underlying performance. The acting police commissioner in this country, as far as my understanding goes, has all the powers which any police commissioner will have. His powers have not been diminished as an acting police commissioner. He has all the powers. He's in charge of the resources, financial and otherwise, of the police service. All right? So he has all that. And given the number of times that his contract has been renewed by the police service commission, it will seem to me that the police service commission did not think that he was adequate. When they, inadequate, sorry. When they did his assessment. Because if you read the, 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 the regulations, sorry, the, the role of the Police Service Commission, you will see that the role of the Police Service Commission is in fact to deal with the police commissioner and to appoint and reappoint the police commissioner to do the assessments um, relating to his performance and what have you. That is, what, that is the role of the, of the Police Service Commission. And that is clear in, in what the rule says here. The, under the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago, the Police Service Commission is an independent body, independent body, developed and managed the monitoring, appointment, disciplinary, and appeal functions of the police service. And it says here, the ex it, it, one of the important st things it has to do is with the, um, the review of the performance of the, of, of the commissioner. So if they were not happy with the performance of the commissioner, why, acting commissioner, why have they been reappointing him over and over? They had the, the um, opportunity to, 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 Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the point I'm making is that the Police Service Commission seem to be very satisfied with the performance of the acting police commissioner. They seem to be very, they, they have been re reappointing the men. And if anyone, anybody has to ask, is ask the Police Service Commission, you know, well then, why did you reappoint him? And they have re reappointed him based on the assessment. What will be vital for the public's interest is to know what criteria they have been using to assess the acting police commissioner. What criteria they have been using to do that? Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, the, the causes, the, 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 the question in my mind, when I think of the Police Service Commission and the reappointment of the Police Service Commissioner, given the increase in murders, given the fact that the country is in a state where they are asking to be protected and so on, is what kind of police commissioner, acting or otherwise, we need in the country at this correct, point in time. And my view is that the Police Service Commission has not properly examined the kind of competencies of a police commissioner at this particular point. Leadership, as my good friend from La Hoqueta, Tal Power in charge of the public service will tell you, leadership is situational. Leadership is situational, and every situation requires a different set of competencies and a different set of skills. Is it that what we are doing is making the mistake of having an administrative type of police commissioner at this point in time, when in fact we need an operational police co commissioner at this point in time in the country? There's nothing. We need a, 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 a police commissioner who, in my view, should have operational skills. And I'm not saying whether Mr. Williams has operational skills or not have operational skills. But I do believe that we are failing because we do not have a police commissioner with operational skills in the country. Operational skills in the country. I think that, you know, is effective management, if I may just sum it up in my last few minutes here, effective management is primarily, in my view, an intelligent set of responses and strategic interventions, given the exigencies of a particular situation. 
And I think that that is what we are lacking. We are lacking. I think that the, 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 the Police Service Commission has a duty to tell the country what criteria it has been using in order to appoint um, the police commissioner, whether acting or otherwise. Because I do not think that the, the issue in the country is whether the police commissioner is acting or the police commissioner is not acting. Correct. Because he has all the powers and he has all the, all, all the support. But I do believe that we are missing the boat when we, because we are not looking at the operational side of the situ, as the situation requires in the country at this point in time. Madam Speaker, I know I have time. Maybe I will never get an opportunity um, when we come back to deal with this. But uh, you know, Madam Speaker, the reality is that um, I was going to identify several other things in the, in the country. But I want to tell you, Madam Speaker, that part of it would have had to do with the education system and how the education system is failing our children and marginalizing them and, and making them feel that they don't have opportunities for the future when in fact we should be revising the curriculum and we should be tailoring it so that people really feel they have a chance and like the leader said, uh, opposition leader said, that they are not feeling excluded or left out. Thank you. Honourable Members, I have been advised that it is the wish of the House to refer to the item of business statement by Ministers. I now call upon the Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I have been authorised by the Cabinet to make this statement on the injection of funds into the Unimed Group Health Plan for Monthly Paid Officers. By way of background, the Unimed Group Health Plan for monthly paid officers was introduced by the PNM government after negotiations with the Public Services Association and the Trinidad and Tobago Unified Teachers Association <coughs> with effect from April the 1st, 2004 as a benefit for members of the civil and teaching services and holders of certain offices within the purview of the Salaries Review Committee. Currently, the plan has a membership of 30,231 persons, comprising 22,544 individuals and 7,687 family members. The plan provides coverage for major, major medical up to $1 million, surgical benefits, medical benefits, diagnostic services, prescribed drugs, hospital services, dental services, vision benefit, death and disability benefit. Since its introduction, the plan has been heavily utilized by its members. Additionally, in 2012, the feature of family coverage which provided a similar level of benefits was included for members. The current monthly contribution for individual coverage is $129 per month, and that for family coverage is $287 a month, while the contribution ratio applicable to both individual and family coverage is 60-40 for the employer and the employee, respectively. These rates of contribution have been in effect since 2012. It should be noted that these rates are among the lowest in the industry. Over time, the cost of medical services and procedures has continued to increase simultaneously with the usage of the plan by its members. There has also been increased usage of the plan, especially with the introduction of family coverage. Industry statistics indicate increases in costs over the last five years in the following areas. Diagnostic services, a 15% increase. Prescribed services, a 20% increase. Hospital services, a 30% increase. The existing rates of contribution together with the increased costs in health care and the usage of the plan by its members have had a negative impact on the financial resources of the plan and the plan is currently in deficit. To address this situation, the review of the rates of contribution has been engaging the attention of the management committee. However, while this is being finalized, members <coughs> of the plan have been experiencing difficulty in the settlement of their claims. If the current financial situation which makes it extremely difficult to treat with claims persists without corrective action by the state, 
the UNIMED group health plan for monthly paid officers will become insolvent. Such an occurrence will be a regressive step for public officers in terms of the benefits which they currently enjoy and have enjoyed since 2004 because of the PNM, while its impact on the members of the plan would be quite deleterious. Further, should the operation of the plan cease, it is anticipated there would be an increased demand on the existing public health care system with significant negative consequences, including delays encountered at public health institutions and a resultant increase in lost man hours. Madam Speaker, the government has reviewed the entire situation, including the impact on the health and well-being of public officers and recognizes the value of a healthy workforce in the delivery of its services. In this regard, in order to clear the current deficit in the plan, as we are a responsible, caring PNM government, the Cabinet took a decision yesterday to inject $21 million into the group health plan for monthly paid officers to ensure its continued viability. PNM to the rescue again. Leader of the House. Thank you very kindly, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I beg to move that this House to now adjourn sine die. Honorable Members, the question is that this House do now adjourn sine die. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? The ayes have it. This house now stands adjourned for those who don't know without a date. <laughs>